great to see you this morning. Just got some quick announcements. Um, some of these are missions related. Our, during the month of March, our focus is missions. We want to like hit a reset button and make sure we're all on the same page on why we're in this earth, why we're here. We're not here just to exalt the Lord, which is important. It's, we, our mission statement is threefold, to exalt the Lord. We're here for that. We want to do that. Encourage each other. We're here for that. But the third part is evangelism and missions, engage in spreading his message to the world. And that's what we are about. If a church doesn't do that, they're not really a church. They're just a social organization. Without missions and evangelism, you're not a church. So we like to take March and focus on that. And we've got a focus on that this morning. And our guest speaker is going to come and share in just a few minutes. But I want to share just some announcements and a thank you note and just something about Faith Promise. Um, one of the folks, uh, organizations we partner with is Partners Against Domestic Violence. We try to help them when we can. And we got a thank you note from, our, uh, from them for our children's ministry and for our church who helped them with some supplies. And here's the thank you note. Thank you so much, Tracy and GCC. Thank you so much for the donation of food. Uh, items and cleaning supplies for to partners against domestic violence as Gwinnett shelter our clients and shelter staff were thrilled to receive them and we are so grateful thank you for your heart to serve victims of domestic violence we appreciate you partners against domestic violence Gwinnett shelter it's hard to believe but there are folks even in Gwinnett County that have to leave their home because somebody's beating on them or hurting them or their kids and I just I don't even know as a child as a, a woman, or in some cases as a man, I don't know how you, I couldn't even begin to explain, understand the depth of pain that's got to be, and to leave your house with nothing but the clothes on your back and what you can grab on your way out the door. So Partners Against Domestic Violence helps those folks, and I'm, I'm glad to help those who help those folks. So thank you for your help. Let me tell you about our, our day. This was so funny to me. Usually, we have one missionary here at a time. It just doesn't work out for several missionaries to be here. This morning, we have three of our missionary families that we support all here at the same time. And it wasn't planned. Yeah. It wasn't. It was sort of planned and sort of not. Let me tell you what, what's happening here. One of our new missionaries is a man named Richelieu Reeves, and you're going to hear about his ministry this morning. Uh, from Steve Almy, who's, who's uh, on his board and one of his representatives, going to come and share some stuff. So Richelieu, we're going to hear about him this morning. I did not know this, but Larry and MC Legrand were going to be here. I just found out a couple of weeks ago that they were going to be here. I was like, I didn't know that. And then Dave and Peggy Jones are here this morning because Richelieu used to live in their basement. <laughs> so when he came from his country to go to school, they opened their home to him for Three years, three and a half years, he lived with them, and uh, they provided a place for him to stay, and he wanted to go back when he graduated from Luther Rice Seminary. He wanted to go back to his people, to his country, and help start churches and train pastors to start churches, and so this morning, we are like triply blessed. So Dave and Peggy, if y'all would stand up, MC and Larry right there, these are champion people right here. And I, th I think um, those four folks will testify, and Richelieu is going to learn over time that when we sign on to support a missionary, we sign on for life until God just changes the circumstances. Sometimes, like with Steve and Kathy Crawford, they just retired and they're coming off the field, so we have stopped that support, but that's, that was understood going into it. So when we sign on to support missionaries, it's not a whim. It's not something we do until we fall out of the mood. Like, we commit to those folks, and we ask them every year for a weekly report. Once a, I'm sorry, a yearly report. Once a year, they send us a report on what they're doing, if they still need us to help, if their finances are okay. Uh, so it's definitely a partnership. Uh, so Larry and MC are here. They, were, they spoke in one of the Sunday school classes. I think, did y'all get a basket yet? Oh, good, good, good. Forget I just said that. Take it back. It didn't happen. <laughs> Give me a second to take my foot out of my mouth. I'm like Peter, the Apostle Peter. Sometimes the only time he opened his mouth was to change feet. Um, 
But they'll be at uh, they'll be at the Gwinnett Global Prayer today after church, and if you want to go be a part of that, and you'll hear more about their ministry. Um, we have cards printed up uh, for all of our missionaries. If you go out in the lobby uh, and then hang a left as you're going out, there's a table over there with a globe on it. There are a bunch of pamphlets that uh, Steve brought for Richelieu's ministry. There's a card for every one of our missionaries, so you can grab one of these, and it tells you about what they're doing and how you can pray for them. So there's one. I've got, I've got three in my hands. I've got one for Dave and Peggy Jones. I've got one for Larry and MC, and I've got one for Richelieu. So pick these up if you want to know. And they're here. You can ask them any questions. They'd be glad to answer them for you of what they're doing, how their ministry's doing, and how you can pray for them and help them. Um, we sponsor, or not, that's not the right word. Uh, we believe in faith promise. We don't take pledges. It's faith promise. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is a promise of faith. It's between you and God. It has nothing to do with our church. It has, it's not a pledge. You don't sign your name anywhere on this. It is you asking the Lord, what do you want me to do for missions this year? Like, what do you want me to do? If it's $10 or $10,000, that's the number is actually not significant. It's our obedience individually that's significant. To trust God and say, that I, and then this is not money coming out of your budget. This is faith promise. God, I'm trusting you to give me this amount of dollars over and above what I make. And I promise you that I will give that to missions. And it is a, it's an amazing faith-building thing. It is a promise of faith. Now, I don't ask for money for our buildings and our budgets. I just, I just don't. I have zero problem asking for money for missions. Because every penny of it goes back out. We don't keep it in-house here. So pray about what God would have you do for missions. And if the Lord doesn't give you a number, okay, that's fine. You've been obedient to pray. You've been obedient to ask. I would encourage our children. You would be surprised at the, that the amount of money children have prayed about and said, God, I'm going to trust you for this amount of money, which is huge for a child with no job. And over the year, you find that those kids get money for birthday money and for all kinds of different things. And God answers the prayers of those little people's faith right? So this is something everybody in the church can do. If you've got a great job, if you don't have a job, if you're a senior adult on a fixed income, if you're a child that didn't have a job, but you have an allowance, you just pray about what God would have you to do and just sit back and see what he does. Um, we're partnering with Faith Promise, and that happens this week. Our host week is today to through next Sunday, March the 19th. Family Promise, what did I say? Faith Promise? It's F promise, FP, faith promise, family problem. Family promise starts today. Uh, if you want to know more about how to participate this week, please see Laura. Laura, are you here? There you are. See that lovely lady with her hand up in the air? That is one of the sweetest women on, on this planet right there, Laura. And, um, yeah, she's great. And if you have any questions about that, ask Laura. She's, she's leading the charge on that and uh, does such a great job. April the 7th is Good Friday. We're going to have the Stations of the Cross on Good Friday in here. Uh, this will be our third year to do this. If you come on Friday on Good Friday, you know it's very meaningful. You kind of come through here. There's seven stations. They're all self-explanatory. There's scripture there. There are things you can do to uh, experiential to kind of put your hands on and do things as you go through and remember what it was like for Jesus when he died on the cross. So I hope you come. It'll be on Friday, May the, or April the 7th. And it'll be from 5 to 8. You can take your time. There's no service. There's no start time, end time. We'll open the doors at 5. We'll close them at 8. And you just come anytime. Some people come and they'll stay an hour. Other people come and stay 15 minutes. That's okay. The idea is that you're preparing your heart for Easter Sunday. And on Easter Sunday, what happened that's of significance to us? He is risen. That's right. He is risen indeed. We, uh, one other thing, we've postponed uh, our men's breakfast from April to May, and I'll tell you why. Uh, a friend of mine uh, found out he was going to be able to be here. Uh, his name is Walt Wiley. I don't know if you know Walt, but he, uh, he was with Walt through the Bible for a long time. And then he had his own ministry, uh, Winning with Encouragement. Uh, he's probably led 100 trips to Israel. I've been on to Israel with Walt. Walt was also the chaplain for the Braves when they were doing well. So I attribute some of that to Walt's prayer life and his influence for the kingdom 
in that locker room. He's a great guy. He's a riveting speaker. Like, Walt is like, wow. You know, he, he makes the Bible come alive. And uh, since we could get him on su- Sunday, the 21st, I said, can you come a day early and do our men's breakfast and speak to about 50 or 60 guys that will be there? And he said, oh, yeah, I'd love to. So, guys, put that on your calendar. On Saturday morning, the 20th at 8 a.m., Walt's going to speak, be there for our men's breakfast, and then he'll stay over and speak in both services on Sunday. Two other things. We've got a couple of prayer requests. Mike Yox is, had a triple bypass Friday. I saw Mike yesterday. Uh, he says, now I've had bypass. He's still drugged a little bit. So he says, I'm fine, but I'm concerned about Marilyn. Marilyn says, I'm fine, but I'm concerned about Mike. The truth is, uh, Marilyn's been through a lot watching Mike. Mike went through surgery. It was successful. Uh, hopefully today they'll put him in a regular room. In a couple of days he'll get to go home. So just pray for Mike. Mike is a prayer warrior as much as anybody I've ever met in my life. Mike prays. If he says he'll pray for you, he prays for you. He's got a journal with your name and your kids' names and your requests, and he calls and he asks about you. He'll check up on you. I guarantee you there's not ten people in this room that he hasn't prayed for by name. And so I think it would be proper to pay that back and to pray for him so if you would when you think about mike and Marilyn, just keep them in your prayers and also yesterday when i was at the hospital visiting with mike i got a phone call that mary joe acri had had a stroke so i head to the, the the hospital and while i'm driving to her hospital i call her we talked for a while she sounded normal i got there we talked for a while they don't think it was a stroke but they don't know what it is. She flatlined yesterday. Her heart just stopped, and they had to bring her back. So they're, they're working on her. So I know Mary Jo, would, Mary jo Acre, she always sits right over here, right over there with all these ladies, and uh, I miss her not being here today. So just pray for her. She apologized to me that she wasn't going to be here. Like, okay. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, you need to take care of you, and we'll get you back when we can get you back. So let's just take a minute and pray for these two folks and for missions this year and what God has for us to do. Father, thank you for missions. Thank you for this. This is your idea. Missions and evangelism is your idea. You, you could have done this a different way, and we would have been excluded from the joy of it and the party of it. But you have allowed us to be a part of getting the gospel out around the world and across the street. And, Lord, help us to be obedient in what you have for us to do. I thank you for David and Peggy being here today, for the investment that you put on their heart 40 years ago to leave California, to leave a secure job to come here and start a church. And now I look at Gwinnett Community and what was birthed 40 years ago. And now they're ministering to pastors and the pastor's wives and I just pray for them. I pray for their health. I pray for their support. Thank you for Larry and MC, how you're using them to reach people all over the world. And, Lord, they both have had some health challenges, and I pray for them. Thank you for Richelieu and the new partnership we have with him. I pray for Steve as he comes to share Richelieu's ministry. And uh, as Steve shares some slides and some information about what Richelieu is doing and how we can partner and help him and pray for him in his ministry. So thank you that this tribe of missionary families is growing, that we're expanding our arms of love from this place locally, nationally, and globally. And now Richelieu is one of those. So we thank you for that. Pray for Steve as he comes to share in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Steve Almy. He's going to come and and, uh, share with us some ministry stuff about Richelieu. So Steve, welcome. Would you help me in welcoming him? Thank you, Pastor. I think I'm okay. Can you hear me? Well, what a great worship service so far. That music was just so wonderful. And when you were singing hallelujah for the great things he has done, not only has he done them, but he is doing them, and he will continue to do them. And what a great opportunity to serve a risen God. And I am so proud to be here and so thankful First of all, let us begin with just a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, oh gracious God, thank you so much for the blessing you gave us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, none of us were worthy of it. But Lord, you loved us so much that Jesus died on that cross for us. Thank you. And Lord, now I ask you to bless the words that I have to say and keep me to the words you would have me to say and guide everything I say today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I want to bring you greetings uh, from Rich Lou Reeves. He couldn't be here today. It was a little long of a drive for him. Um, but he, um, he wanted to tell you that he was praying for you and praying for us even now. And uh, in fact, he sent me a text when I was right before the service started and said, I'm praying for you right now. And um, so what a blessing. But he also said that he's praying for God's grace and peace to come to this church and to continue to bless this church like never before. Because you may not know it. I'm going to have to turn this on. Uh-oh. I'm up. Okay. But this church has always, for a long, long time, played a valuable part in Rich Lou's ministry. In fact, I need to tell you a little bit about Rich Lou Reeves. Rich Lou, uh, I, I made a mistake earlier. I said he was born in 51. He wasn't. He was born in 71, on March 11th, and um, in Liberia. And when he was eight or nine years old, he was saved. He came to accept Jesus Christ. Um, and he was baptized. However, some bad things happened to Liberia. And uh, they became involved in a deep, bad civil war where hundreds of thousands of people were murdered, where the entire infrastructure of the nation was destroyed. And one day, in fact, it was March 11th, on his birthday, his 19th birthday, he was walking down the road when a group of rebels seized him. They were going to kill him. Miraculously, Rich was able to escape missing bullets as he fled. And when he made that escape, he knew, and he'll tell you to this day, he knew in his heart that his mission was to reach out to the lost, the world, and to his native country, and bring the gospel to him. So, make a long story short, a few years later, Rich had to leave Liberia because it was such a dangerous place. And he traveled to Sierra Leone, then he went to a place called Ghana and was, work, and was actually living in a refugee camp. And he was working with the youth group there because he wanted to serve God and he was working with the youth there. And he ran into a couple missionaries that were there. There's three missionaries, one of whom was named Jeremy Jones. And Jeremy and Rich became quite close friends there. And Jeremy said to Rich, why don't you come to the United States to go to Bible school and seminary? And Rich says, oh, how can a poor man like me ever have the hope, ever have the chance of doing that? Jeremy says, you ought to write my dad. His dad happened to be pastor of this church at the time, David Jones. Today, thank you. Uh, today, Rich Lou always refers to David and Peggy as his American mom and dad, his American mother and father. This church voted back then to bring Rich Lou over and sponsor him here. And he lived for three and a half years with David and Peggy Jones as he went to seminary at Luther Rice Seminary. And when he graduated, and a lot of people will tell you, the very few people that come from the foreign countries and go to seminary, go to college here, go back to their native lands. But Rich Lou was called a God to go back. And he always said that. I remember when we... Day of his ordination, Sandra and I were sitting here watching him being ordained. And he said, I'm going back to Liberia. And he left back to Liberia with only three families supporting him at the time. That's all that he had. And then during his early months back at home, he really struggled. I remember getting an email one time that says, I only received a couple hundred dollars this month and I don't have enough money for fuel for the generator. See, there's no power unless you have a generator in Liberia. And he said, and I, don't, I can't read my Bible. I can't study my Bible. 
But things have passed and things have gotten better for Rich. He's now married and has two young, small children. He is a thriving ministry, reaching people, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But first of all, you need to know, I keep pointing the wrong way, Pastor. You need to know that the Holy Spirit is what empowers this ministry. It's not Rich Lou Reeves. It's not us as individuals. The Holy Spirit's guidance. It's God who's in charge, and it's God who's planning it, and God is making it happen. <clears throat> and he did receive power through the Holy Spirit, and he has that power now. And most people don't even know where, Af- where Liberia is. Um, if I were to ask the average person where Liberia is, they probably couldn't point it out. I hope I can. Well, if I can get my thing to work. It's a little yellow country up here on the western tip of Africa. Um, I sh- I'll bring it up to you because we do have it. There it is. Now you can see what it, where it's at. It's uh, surrounded by m- mainly the Atlantic Ocean, but uh, on the uh, west is Sierra Leone, and on the north is Guinea, and on the east is a country called Cote d'Ivoire, for you people who grew up like me, that's the Ivory Coast. And they just changed it to the French-sounding name. In Ghana is where Rich ended up in a refugee camp. So um, I think that we need to remember that Rich Lou Reeves is, uh, comes from a very small country. That country, by the way, is about the size of Tennessee. So it's not a big country. Some facts about it, about 5,000 people. What's amazing is average age is 18.9 years. Only 20% of the population are over the age of 40. Think about that. How many of us are over the age of 40 now? I, I look around a little bit. I see a couple people who aren't over the age of 40. But most of us, I would say the vast majority of us are over the age of 40. Only 20% of that population. 45% are under the age of 15. So it's a very, very, very young population. Now, the other thing is, half Liberians live in abject poverty. What, I, what that means is, they don't have good sanitary water to drink. They don't have enough food to eat. They don't have electricity. They don't have a good home. They don't have good sanitation. They, they don't have good shelter. Liberia, overall, is the ninth poorest country in the world. So you're talking about Rich Lou Reeves was willing to go back to that nation to lead people to Christ. Now, Liberia was founded by 10,000 freed American slaves, which most people don't know, uh, under the time when James Monroe was president. And uh, the capital city is now called Monrovia, after James Monroe. Uh, Our training center is in a town called Carysburg. They speak English. English is the official language. Now, there are 10 nationality groups there. uh, And um, so there's a lot of other languages spoke too. And when they're not talking to someone like me, they uh, sort of have a mixture of that language group and English. And so you can't always understand everything they say. But but they can understand English. They read English. Um, One of the main things is most of the nation is without dependable electricity and usable water. When I say that, they don't have an electric grid. When we hear go into what house do you go into? You don't turn on the electricity. They don't have that luxury. Some places don't even have a switch to switch. You have to have generators. If you don't have a generator, you don't have electricity in that nation. Only the military and the government have electricity. Um, water, when I was there, you couldn't. we had water to shower in, but we couldn't brush our teeth with that water. We had to use bottled water to brush our teeth. I mean, to give you an idea of the kind of environment it is. The reason for the poverty is because from 1989 to 2003, there was a terrible civil war. And that civil war destroyed the country's infrastructure. A quarter of a million people were died. Remember, it's a small country. Size of Tennessee, a quarter million people died in that country. Then, after they got over the Civil War, they finally started to make roads. Ebola hit. 
Ebola. Rich wrote a book on Ebola. Ebola hit hardest in Western Africa than any other place in the world, and Liberia was one of the hardest hit. And although it was an extreme curse to that nation, it was also a blessing in one way because as they got used to social distancing from to protect themselves from Ebola, they also were able to be prepared when COVID hit to avoid some of the problems with COVID. Uh, they had COVID, but as every country did. Uh, the other thing about Liberia you need to know is a country of tremendous corruption. As Pastor and I were talking uh, during the break, there's a lot of corruption in that country. And it's in the government. It's in, uh, that, that shouldn't surprise you. Uh, it, it's in just about every, every act of life that you see. And so there's a lot of corruption. So one of the things you need to know is that this passage, it means a lot to me because I think that's the reason I'm here, to help Rich's ministry. Rich's ministry is a wonderful thing, but what you've done here in this church before you even decide to give a financial donation was set the stage. And most of you who were here at that time probably didn't even realize what was happening. You were responsible for thousands of souls coming to know Jesus Christ. You're responsible for thousands of people being trained, pastors being trained. That's, that's the impact. That's the impact. And, and, and that's what your church has done. And God says in Ephesians 2.10, we're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared before us. That's the reason we do these things. We don't always see the results right away, but boy, I'll tell you what, when you look back, and, and what David and Peggy Jones have done, and I, you know, I hate to see you, but what you've done for Jesus and through Rich Lou, just amazing. He, there's not a day come by that he doesn't tell me about how wonderful you were and how you started this ministry and this church. This is Rich Lou Reeves. Uh, Pastor Reeves, uh, as I told you, is 51 today. You know what? I haven't even looked at my notes, Pastor. Uh, I think I can get by without him. Uh, but Pastor, he, he's, um, when he went to Liberia, he had two or three things he wanted to do. He said, I want to take the gospel to the lost. And he began doing that. He's gone throughout the nation doing that. He goes throughout Liberia. The only time I've seen him stuck down is during the rainy season and a couple of times when bridges were washed out and he couldn't get by. Um, he also wanted to train pastors. Last year, 900 pastors went through training with us. Think about it, 900 pastors. These are people without education, some of them. Some of them have never been to college, uh, but they love Jesus. And we'll talk more about that. 900 pastors. People were saved. Pastors are trained. And what this will do, it's the future generations. It's not just this generation. It's the, and there's a song uh, that we sang when we were over there. But it's one generation after the other. It's your children and my children and their children and their children. It'll go on and on. That's what he's doing. And that's what's going on through this ministry that you're supporting. That you're supporting. A couple of years, a few years ago, Richard had, Richard has dreams. And, and, and he said, I have a dream of a big training academy in the middle of Liberia that we can train pastors at. And we started talking about it we decided to go for a 501c3. That's a nonprofit organization. That's so that people can give to it without having to pay taxes. And that probably always hurt us over the early years. And, um, but we decided to do it. We went under the umbrella of another ministry. Um, it's based out of Waynesboro for, t for a one year. And we began to purchase land and we began to build the, this training center, which we'll show in a little bit. And uh, that training center is just about complete now. And uh, we, 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 I'll show it to you. But this is Rich Lou Reeves. He has a heart. And he has another dream now. He wants us to be able to come on board with a college and uh, have a relationship with an American college uh, which so these guys can get college, college uh, graduates. And that's where we're going next. What's going to happen in this country... 
It's beyond amazing. This was one of the training pastors we held for 375 pastors in Monrovia Christian Fellowship. It's the largest church in downtown Monrovia. Uh, those windows you see are not air-conditioned. Uh, they're open air. And there's a few fans in there to keep it. When our speaker spoke on the first morning, the heat got them so bad that they almost passed out. So we had to replace them. But, you know, it's hot there. Uh, but these pastors, when they get excited... And when they're praising and when they're worshiping, you know there's been praise and worship going on. I'll tell you what, it's really going on there. And they get excited. And you'll also see that these guys are all young. Now, there's, you'll see some women there. They're church leaders in, in their churches that came with them. Um, these men are young. They're not well-educated. They're poor, but they love Jesus. They don't have hardly anything. Most of these had Bibles. But not all of them even had Bibles. Can you imagine being a pastor without a Bible? It's amazing. Well, not only that, when they came to these conferences, they didn't have any food. So we fed them. This, this conference lasted three days. We fed them for three days. Now, I'll tell you, the food was not exactly McDonald's. That's what it was. I ate this meal once. Uh, <laughs> It has rice and fish and fish gravy and bush meat. And uh, we'll talk about bush meat sometime in private if you want to ask me what it is. Um, but it's not, it's not important. It's, it was edible. I ate it. This is Pastor Mamala Dukalai. Pastor Mamala Dukalai is the pastor of Monrovia Christian Fellowship. And he, said, he, called, he says, call me Pastor Duke. I think he thought he was John Wayne or something. You know, <laughs> call me Pastor Duke. But anyway, Mama La Ducalai said, the most important thing you can do in this nation is to teach pastors to fish so they can go out and fish themselves. Rather than having American pastors come over there and try to teach them, teach and witness to people, let their pastors do it. American pastors are going over there to teach them and train them up so that they can do it. And that's what we're doing. Now, one of the things that these pastors don't have, they don't have libraries. And so we hunted for a study Bible um, that would be good for, um, for pastors without libraries. And you need to have a good study Bible to do that. And uh, fortunately, we were able to get the donation, full donation from one of the publishers. of a, That's the Reformed Study Bible there. And it's a thick Bible. It's full of stuff. It weighs five pounds each. We sent a ton of them over there. When I say a ton, I mean a literal ton. 2,000 pounds worth of Bibles. Um, we sent them to Liberia on a ship. The only way you can get them there is a container ship. You can't send 2,000 pounds worth of Bibles on an airplane. I mean, maybe you can, but it costs a lot more money than I have. And these are 24 men. You can see them there with their Bibles. And they're also take, participating in something called Bible Training Center for Pastors, BTCP. BTCP, is how most of people refer to it, is a training program, a 520-hour training program um, that these pastors have to complete to be certified. And uh, it can take up to 18 months. And we send pastors over there to teach generally a week at a time, and there's a very designated curriculum they follow. And uh, these people were the start of that. That happens to be John Mark Oliver from a, a church in Conyers. This is uh, another pastor teaching them outside. Sometimes it gets hot in those buildings, so they go out and sit in the shade where, where it's a little cooler. And... Um, so that's where he is preaching outside. Now, just so you know a little bit of the country, take a look at that picture Give a little bit. When I got, went into Monrovia, when I flew into the airport, Robbie Airport, it's a 26-mile drive downtown. And if you've ever been there, I can tell you something about it. 26 miles, it's a paved road. It's one of the few paved roads in Liberia. But to get there, 26 miles, you know what I mean? There's one traffic light. 26 miles, one. That's the only traffic. Well, so what does that mean? It means they 
the driving rules there are really simple. The biggest and the fastest <laughs> to get there. And uh, they don't all drive on the same side of the road even. Another the rule is that most people don't have transportation. Rich doesn't have transportation. When he goes, he takes public transportation, which usually means the motorcycle. The motorcycles are like taxi cabs. And as you see there, the one that just pulled right in front of us in traffic, uh, I happen to get a picture, has three people on it. You ever seen three people on a pet? Well, I can tell you, I've seen five or six people on them before. And they don't, they don't have helmets. And on the right there is another one, with three people on it. That's their mode of transportation. And if you think transportation and is tricky over there, going to the grocery store is another thing. Um, most of us wouldn't feel comfortable going to a grocery store like it. This is the grocery store, and everywhere except maybe downtown Monrovia, where they don't have a lot of, you know, even then it's pretty a lot of open air places. But there's a few uh, in, in store stores. So this is their supermarket. This is what the church looks like in most rural areas in Liberia. Thatch roofs. When uh, we gave the dedication to our training center, there was a facility like that that I spoke at. And uh, it is um, plastic chairs in the norm, some benches. You see some stacks of wood there where they propped them up to build some things where they could sit. Uh, that's the way um, most churches are conducted. In this case, Rich is talking and teaching there at this time. Now, Stephen Tolbert Estates area sounds like a really richy place. And at one time it was, because Stephen Tolbert was a wealthy businessman who was killed in the Civil War. His uh, brother was once president of Liberia. But um, right now it's not a wealthy estate anymore. And this is some of the places we witnessed to. And here's some ladies uh, gathered together in prayer uh, in this area. This is what we call the chicken soup factory area, where we witnessed in the chicken soup fa factory area. And the reason they called it is why? Because there used to be a chicken soup factory there. <laughs> it's been, it was destroyed during the Civil War, but they still call them by the old names. This is pretty common to the kind of places where Liberians live. And this is a city, by the way. This is a city. So we're not talking about real fancy uh, homes. Last month, 37 people accepted the Lord. Um, that was actually two months ago now. Two of them were of Muslims. So Muslims are coming to know Jesus around the world. And uh, that's a marvelous thing. People are coming to know Jesus through this ministry whom you support. And uh, the man in the blue shirt there is one of the uh, richest associate pastors. Doesn't have any income coming in to do this. He does it because he loves Jesus. Now, he has to work other jobs to, to earn enough to survive. But, um, you know, one of these things about these pastors, even, I don't know if I mentioned this, but even the best pastors only make around $500 a month. I don't remember if I said that in this session or just the first session, but when you think about that, $500 a month, it's not very much money. And you think, well, the cost of living is over there is less, right? The cost of living is just as high as it is here. The difference is the standard of living is much lower there. Now, this is the road to the training center. This is the road to the training center. As you can see, it's well paved and uh, sidewalks on both sides. It's a busy thoroughfare. And this is during the dry season. What you don't see is Right around that little, right before that palm tree there, there's a big drop-off that goes into <laughs> a big puddle of water. When I saw that coming up, I was really, really nervous about it. But we made it. This is the same road during the rainy season. Now, the rainy season starts in the end of May and goes through October, sometimes the beginning of November. And uh, the, the difference between the rainy season there and here is that um, the, the rainy season and the dry season is it doesn't rain every day during the dry season. It rains about every other day. <laughs> That's how difficult travel can get during the rainy season in Liberia. This is the beginning of our new training hall that, that I talked to you about. 
This was in 2021. This is the, is the guest quarters that we built for visiting pastors. That's in 2021. This is the training hall was not complete when I visited there last year. Even though we still had our dedication, that's what it looked like. The roof wasn't on yet. They have zinc roofs over there. This are the six buildings that are virtually complete. Right there you see the blue building is the kitchen. The two green buildings are dormitories which will sleep 120 people. And the building in the left-hand corner there, the uh, gray building with the pink stripe, there's two of them, and they're for guest quarters. And uh, this is the training hall prior to painting. It's now showed some pictures. It's a bright yellow building. Um, I tried to get them to paint it red and black, but uh, they wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> I asked them when they... I guess I'm, I'm too much of a Georgian. I said, what are you going to put in the oven in the kitchen? And they took me out back because we were feeding some people who were visiting for the dedication. This is the oven. <laughs> I said, oh. And they said, we're just going to bring them up and put them up on a stand because the kitchen, had a, even though it had a roof over it, had open sides. Rice is a problem in Liberia. Uh, it's, it's their main instead of food. And last year, during this time, uh, no, this summer, I guess, um, this last summer, rice became a shortage. It was really hard to get. And we shipped a 1,000 pounds of rice to Richlou and his staff that were going around witnessing people so they wouldn't have to worry about having enough food to eat while they're, for their families while they were traveling. How, do you, how can you pray for us? Pray, first of all, that God's will be done in Liberia, that his kingdom come to Liberia just as it is in heaven. That's the most important thing. Secondly, pray for Rich Lou's health and the health of his family. Rich Lou Reeves uh, has bouts with malaria and typhoid and typhus on a regular basis. And uh, since I've known him almost every year, he has a bout with one of those. Uh, his kids get malaria on a regular basis. Uh, pray that we can find pastors who are willing to go and teach in Liberia to help teach these pastors. Pray that Liberian pastors, once they're taught, they go and take the gospel to the farthest ends of Liberia and preach faithfully God's word. Pray that we have support for furnishing the, the training center. Now, on that note, I need to tell you another prayer request. Liberia is an election year this year, and there's a lot of corruption in that country. And people are very, very worried about the possibility of violence later on this year. They're so worried that we're not even sending any American pastors over there after August. And uh, we're not putting furnishings in it until we see which way it goes. We, we, we have money for a generator, and we have money for a well, but we're just not doing those things. We're just holding up until we make sure there's going to be peace in the country. Um, pray that we can find a college or seminary to partner with us so we can provide degrees to these students. That's one of our big missions right now that I'm working on. And also pray that we can find some additional professional men, men and women, who uh, have a desire to serve God and help us in our missions uh, <clears throat> in Liberia, who are willing to go there and are willing to come on board with us. One final picture here. That's inside the training hall. As you can see, you see there's a person standing way in the back. So it's a good-sized building. It's a huge building. It'll seat four or 500 people easy. So we, we have the facilities that we built. Um, it, now, since that, this picture was taken, the insides are all painted up. We just don't have the furnishings in it yet. And we're holding up for that. Matthew, before he gave us the Great Commission, he said, all authority has been given to me. That's to Jesus in heaven and earth. And the authority that Jesus gives us is the way we can continue this mission. I want to thank you so much for the heart this church has for missions. I want to thank you for coming on board to partner with Rich Lou Reeves and what he's doing in Liberia. I can tell you that what you've done in the past and what you're doing now will make the difference in lives, not of hundreds, but of thousands. 
and for not only this generation, but for generations to come. Thank you so much, Pastor. Wow, thank you, Steve. You all right? You know, I know there's a, a, the harvest is great everywhere. I mean, the, there's opportunity around the world. But I'm looking at these stats, and I've seen, I heard the presentation twice, and it hit me in the second service. Uh, some of the just basic needs they have with these young families are things like diapers, stuff like that. Imagine if you want bang for your buck in missions. 45% of the nation is under 15. 45%. Wow. If we could help impact that nation, imagine in 25 years the Christian homes, Christian marriages, the Christian young people. Imagine the, the impact we could have, we could help have. So, I mean, it, it's a great ministry, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be partnering with, with them. Uh, instead of a benediction, which is kind of the normal thing we do, I want us to... And Steve mentioned praying that, you know, God's will be done on earth as in, in heaven. And that's what Jesus taught us to pray, taught his guys to pray. He teaches us to pray the same. So I would like for us, if you would just stand with me, and we're going to dismiss this way. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer, or we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. The words are going to be on, on the screen. So if you would join me in this, and this will be our benediction. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. You're dismissed. We'll see you next Sunday. We'll be back in the Gospel of John. Have a good week. Hey, come, come talk to these folks. They're up here. They're here for you. So come meet them and uh, say hey to them.